If you think about the place where the New Testament church started, the central location was Jerusalem itself. I guess if you grew up in a Christian church in America, you oftentimes think it started in America or maybe at least Western Europe or somehow has its origin in Rome. When it comes right down to it, looking back to the New Testament era, the decisions, the leaders were in Jerusalem. After Jesus ascended into heaven, his disciples, uh, some did missionary work and planted churches in other places. Uh, John went to Asia Minor and Peter traveled quite a bit as well. Paul, of course, was uh, planting churches and, and getting them started around the, the Roman Empire. When it came right down to it, Jerusalem was still the focus of the church in the first century. As the generation of the disciples passed on and they handed off the mantle, so to speak, to the next generation, the center of Christianity began to move northward out of Jerusalem after its destruction in A.D. 70 and towards Antioch, the second center, if you will, of Christianity. From there, it seemed the way that the Roman Empire was set up and trade was going back and forth. Pockets of Christians began meeting together in big cities like Ephesus and Corinth and uh, in, in the region of uh, Macedonia and Thessalonica. But probably the, the place where Christianity began to be focused most after Antioch would be in Rome. I mean, Rome was the focus of the, the Roman Empire at that point in time. That's where the emperors were. That's where all the excitement was happening, the politics, the trade. And so it was very natural that there would be a lot of Christians in Rome. As the hierarchy of the church, just for logistical reasons, had to grow and, and have more stages of management, so to speak, uh, those bishops that were overseeing different large cities and large populations of Christians began having preeminence over other bishops that were seeing the more, overseeing the more rural areas of Christianity. When the bishops had a chance to meet together, especially in the fourth century when persecution started to, to abate, uh, they came together and would oftentimes meet in Rome or uh, the Roman bishop would take preeminence over some of the other bishops in the conversations that, we, that they were having. Uh, this led to almost like a, a, a role that was over the regular bishop, uh, an archbishop, if you will. And eventually, these would be referred to as patriarchs, and there seemed to be five centers of the patriarchy. You had one in Jerusalem, if nothing else, for historical reasons to, remain a, to retain a, a connection with Jerusalem. There was an archbishop overseeing Antioch. There was another one overseeing Alexandria, which today we would call modern-day Egypt. Uh, there was one in Rome, and there was also one in Constantinople. You see, in the fourth century, Constantine began to shift the, the focus of his work, of, of his, uh, his empire, towards the east. He left standing the things that were in Rome, but he began building a new city out to the east for, for military and political reasons to make sure there was a strong presence of the Roman Empire there. He built on the, the city that today we call Istanbul, but historically speaking throughout the history of the church, its majority name has been known as Constantinople. With these different centers of Christianity, it was kind of interesting how Christianity spread, especially with these main patriarchs, these five patriarchies, when conversations would come together about theology, the opinions and the, and the writings and the preachings, the teachings of the, the ones who were overseeing these, fave, these uh, five major patriarchies, they seemed to have more influence at these ecumenical councils. As time went on and the situations in Rome in the West and in Constantinople in the East began to change, you started to see a drifting apart of the people that were part of the Roman Empire in both of those areas, including Christians and the way that theology was done, the way that religion was practiced. There started to be two different tendencies. Uh, for instance, the, the, the folks in the East, uh, politically speaking, they were dealing with uh, an emperor who was strong. Militarily speaking, he was uh, you know, in, undisputed. And as far as the invasion attempts, the church and the, and the state were very closely linked together in their organization and their calling of ecumenical councils. There was a very favorable re relationship between the church and the state. In Rome, however, with the Roman emperor having moved to the east and having more of a focus in the east, those who were left behind in Rome to rule politically or even in the church oftentimes had a fragmentation or a competition of leadership. When the Germanic tribes began invading from modern-day Russia and Ukraine and those areas and, and began coming down into uh, southern Europe, like into Italy, uh, northern Africa, to Spain, to France, as the Angles and the Saxons and the Jews came into Britain, these Germanic tribes began bringing with them their ideas of religion, and then the churches were responding in the wake of those invasions. It seemed like there was two different situations, two different scenarios, almost two different people groups in the East and in the West. 
So on the eastern side of the, of the Roman Empire, people primarily were speaking Greek. Before that time, Greek was the main cultural language and, and Roman would be, or Latin would be the, uh, the trade language or the economic language. But by the time you get to the oh, ninth century or so, in the east, they're exclusively speaking Greek and in the west, they're exclusively speaking Latin. With these two different languages being spoken, oftentimes the writing and the theological work that's being done among Christians, uh, there's not a whole lot of communication between the two, or at least it starts to, to, to break down. So there are political differences. There, there's a different concept of hierarchy when it comes to these ecumenical councils. Uh, in the East, the church is very happy to have conversations that uh, could go on for centuries to try to work through the, the nitty-gritty or the ramifications of living a certain way and certain doctrines that are taught. In the West, the Pope, uh, the Pope, actually the word Pope comes from the word Papa in the Latin, the, the bishop over the Roman churches who became known as the Pope, he would be the one to make the final decisions, whereas in the East, the tendency was for the patriarchs to get together and discuss those theological things together and hold councils and have these conversations. In the fourth century, the first ecumenical councils that were uh, held in Nicaea in uh, 325 and in Constantinople in 381, they included bishops from the west and from the east. But as these two groups began separating and, and splitting apart, in, on the Roman side or the western side of things, uh, the Roman bishop would oftentimes just make the decisions that were the final say on whether a doctrine should go one way or the other, even if it was just in terms of the language that was used to express something that really everybody held to in the first place. These conversations that, that went on exclusively in the West and Latin and exclusively in the East in Greek, sometimes there was an alienation that was felt between those two groups, not just in the ecumenical councils, but the language was different, the trade seemed to be different, the political situation seemed to be different. In the East, the churches began uh, dealing with the Muslims that were coming in and invading and taking over the Eastern side of the of the Roman Empire. In the West, they had the barbarian tribes and trying to convert those princes who were coming down and taking over Rome and Northern Africa and Spain and France and those other countries in, in Western Europe. So those situations were different as well. Even when it came to education, the education that was provided in the West was primarily tailored for clergy, whereas the education in the Eastern uh, side of the Roman Empire that was oftentimes tailored for a, a greater diversity or a greater variety than just the clergy. So you would have educated lay people who were engaging in high-tech theological conversations, so to speak, or high-level uh, conversations. But in the West, it was primarily among the clergy who were the only ones who were perhaps literate or trained at a higher level to have these conversations. You would see in the East people writing who weren't necessarily clergy on theological topics, but in the West, the writings were primarily by the clergy as well. There seemed to be a, a separation, almost a sibling rivalry between the two at times when it came to, to trade, to theology, to culture, almost like the two began separating apart. And while many had the desire to keep the church together and not have it drift apart, uh, eventually through time the two sides did drift apart. You have the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, the word orthodox refers to a correct teaching or a correct living, a, a correct set of beliefs. When we say that something is orthodox, we're basically saying that it's right. The word Catholic was chosen by the Western Church to, to, use, uh, to emphasize the universality of the church. That if you're faithful to the, the Roman Catholic Church, to the Pope, to the teachings of the, uh, the Western side of the church, if you will, that, that, that identifies you with Christianity. You're part of the universal church. So both sides seem to take their own, uh, their own names, their own cultures, their own practices, both considering themselves Christians. And at times there was a harsh rivalry between the two. At times there was more peaceful dialogue between the two. There were attempts to reunite the two sides together in, in various emperor's rules, uh, reigns throughout the Middle Ages, but oftentimes they just remain separate, especially for language and, and distance reasons. As the church continued to grow, the, uh, some of these rivalries even turned into, at one point in time in 1054, there was a time when the Pope excommunicated the Patriarch of Constantinople, and the Patriarch of Constantinople excommunicated the Pope, each one saying that the other you know, kind of lost contact with Christianity and with the truth. So they mutually excommunicated with one another. But really throughout the history of the Christian church, there have been efforts to... Uh, on, on the one hand, remain separate to remain pure, but on the other hand, recognizing what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4, 
that there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, there has been an attempt to unite the different sides of the church together. You have this large schism between the Eastern and the Western sides of the church in the Middle Ages and later on with the Reformation, as you'll study in your uh, Church History 302 course or the second half of Church History, there was the Reformation efforts that happened in Germany, in England, in Switzerland, and various countries around Western Europe. Two major schisms in the history of the church where the East and West separated and Protestants and Catholics separated at another point in time. It leads me to ask the question uh, as far as where the church is today and what the future of Christianity will be in the future. What is good in terms of diversity and what should all Christians be holding to around the world as far as doctrine, as far as practice is concerned? Should we all continue in using the sacraments, uh, baptism and the Lord's Supper, for example? Uh, should we hold to the same theological statement going back to one of the ancient creeds to say this is what we all believe as Christians? Perhaps the creed that was uh, constructed in Nicaea and refined in Constantinople. Uh, sh should we uh, together practice missionary work? Should we together uh, meet the needs of those who are in need? What exactly do we do together as Christians, globally speaking, where we can all agree this is what it means to be a Christian? I'm excited about theological dialogues that happen between different groups of Eastern Orthodox, Roman Catholic, and Protestants. And at times, uh, happy that I have the freedom also to pursue those conversations and, and follow my Lord, uh, you know, without feeling like there's some other group out there that is going to tell me what I have to believe to be a Christian. It's an interesting tension between wanting to be one and wanting to be correct and follow Jesus Christ directly. It's an ongoing thing that we continue to talk about, even in Protestant denominations today. Should we join together with this other group and under what circumstances? Uh, growing up in a Baptist church or set of churches, we, we tended to like to be very autonomous or independent. But I also had plenty of friends who were involved in strong denominations who, where uh, there was a very close tie between themselves and other churches in their denomination. There are benefits to both. It's an interesting conversation to keep having. But the East-West schism, the, the uh, split between the Eastern and Western halves of the church, began introducing certain issues and questions that we continue to ask today as we study the history of the church and ask the question about the future of the church as well. Are we heading in a more ecumenical movement or should we? Or should we continue to remain to have our, uh, our autonomy as we separately follow the Lord? These are some interesting things to think about and it's been a pleasure talking to you today. God bless you. We'll see you next week.